Um, greetings, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for what I think will be an interesting discussion on the role of the United Nations Assistance Mission of Afghanistan, or as we know it, UNAMA. The UN's role in Afghanistan has been sensitive and contentious for more than two decades, and it's arguably now more important than ever, serving as a bridge for Afghanistan's people to the outside world and as a conduit from the Western world in particular to the Taliban who are now running the country as a minority de facto authority. The head of UNAMA is the former president of Kyrgyzstan, Rosa Otombaeva. She brings an interesting profile to the position as a woman and one whose period in office in her own country was at an important and transitional time for Kyrgyzstan. She understands the region and therefore um, the very real nervousness that Afghanistan's neighbours are now feeling about the return of the Taliban to power and the impact on the security landscape of the region generally. She's so far not been assertive in the role, however, and it's possible that she is overshadowed um, possibly by her deputy, a man of great knowledge and experience in the region generally and Afghanistan in particular, former German ambassador and special representative Marcus Popsel. Uh, since the return of the Taliban to power, in um, August 2021, Unama's role has arguably become even more crucial and that's what we're here to discuss today. We cannot move away from the fact that Afghanistan as a republic uh, had profound problems of poverty and corruption and the government was preoccupied with fighting a, a war, a vicious war that took attention and resources away from the essential task of rebuilding after 2001. And as we now know, the evaporation of institutions has left many people questioning the sustainability of what was built, no matter how good or how solid it seemed at the time. The humanitarian crisis we're now witnessing in Afghanistan is profound and again calls upon UNAMA to play a central role in alleviating suffering, coordinating the distribution of relief, trying to ensure the situation does not tip into complete economic and social collapse. It's apparent willingness uh, to comply with some Taliban constraints and edicts recalls the cautions of almost a century ago that an organisation created to deal with crisis will inevitably itself fall into crisis. So we have a panel of distinguished guests today. They are Ambassador Mahmoud Saikal, former Deputy Ambassador Annie Forsheimer, former Member of Parliament Nahid Farid, and former Acting Mayor of Kabul, Shua Ibrahim. I'm Lynn O'Donnell, journalist, and it's my honour to moderate today's discussion. So each of our guests will have the microphone for 10 or 12 minutes, and then we'll open up to questions from listeners. So please be in touch with any questions that you want to ask. And when you are in touch, tell us who you are and who it is that you would like to address your question to. So let's open our webinar today with a close look at UNAMA's historical legacy with Ambassador Mahmoud Saikal. Ambassador Saikal was Afghanistan's permanent representative to the UN from 2015 to 2019. He also served time in Australia and Japan representing Afghanistan as a diplomat and was a deputy foreign minister. He's a graduate of three universities in Australia, worked in Kabul with UNDP and the Japan International Cooperation Agency. He's currently spending time in Tajikistan, where he joins us from today. His concern here is the upcoming renewal of UNAMA's mandate and the complicating factors uh, most notably in the representation of the permanent membership of the United Nations Security Council. Ambassador Saikal, may I ask you to address us uh, with your concerns for the next um, few minutes. Over to you. Thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, let me thank the AISS uh, for organising this timely webinar and extend my greetings to you, Lynn, as moderator and the distinguished panellists and all the viewers who have joined us. Uh, in this webinar. At the outset, what are the key factors in shaping up or molding the mandate of UNAMA? In my mind, there are a few, about three or four, 
um, the nature of the conflict in Afghanistan involving national, regional, and global interests over 45 years time band. Um, the structure and the functions and powers and the political dynamics of the UN Security Council, specifically the interest and quality of relations between the five permanent members, particularly between United Nations, I mean United States, Russian Federation, and China, and their relations with the 10 elected members uh, and the countries uh, in Afghanistan's region have major impact on how the mandate is molded. In the typical ways of the UN, in particular within the Secretariat in dealing with conflicts is another factor. Uh, naturally, it's influenced by membership fees, uh, financial contributions, senior level appointments, et cetera. As a result, um, my experience shows that there is more interest in reacting to the consequences of the conflicts rather than dealing with the root causes of the conflicts. Um, the lobby of Afghanistan itself, if any, as one of the near founding member of the UN is another important factor. Since August 2021, governance system has fallen in Afghanistan and this aspect is covered by interest groups in a scattered way, mainly by our charged affairs and our diplomats and women activists, etc. I guess another question is that how is UNAMA's mandate perceived? I'm afraid currently politics and diplomacy suffer a huge trust deficit among the people of Afghanistan and perhaps elsewhere in our region as well. For years, we kept saying that war is not the solution. I'm afraid now it is proven that um, diplomacy not only hasn't been the solution, that on occasions it has paved the way for more wars, insecurity and instability. The Geneva Accords of 1988 and the Doha Agreement of 2020 are two clear examples of this. Sadly, both deals were blessed by international systems. So unless and until we bring trust in politics and diplomacy, UNAMA's mandate will be looked at with suspicion, regardless of its substance. Especially if UNAMA in its policy of engagement of appeasement with the Taliban in the hope of seeing change in their practices, ignores millions of victims of the Taliban atrocities. These factors, um, have had impact on the substance of UNAMA mandate and the way UNAMA is perceived. Um, they have also had negative impact on the provisions of UN Security Council resolutions on counterterrorism, namely resolutions 1373 and 1624, and the Taliban sanctions regime. On occasions, the implementation of the resolutions and the sanctions regime have been politicized and poorly monitored and poorly reported. If only they were generally implemented 60 to 70%, the Taliban wouldn't have been or shouldn't have been where they are at the moment. Mind you, supporting the monitoring of the sanctions is part of UNAMA mandate. UNAMA has been around since 2002. Generally, its mandate is being renewed every year by the UN Security Council, although lately, a couple of times, the mandate has been renewed every six months. UNAMA played a key role in the formation of the interim authority in 2002 and the subsequent governance, reconstruction, and development of Afghanistan. I have been a prime witness to that. UNAMA's real testing time came when we saw signs of the return of the Taliban back in 2005, 2006. The security of Afghanistan was changing for worse, but the UNAMA mandate remained the same. I remember in 2007, as a consultant of UNDP to the Afghanistan National Development Strategy, every time I mentioned the presence of Taliban safe havens in Pakistan in the draft report, of the Joint Coordination and Monitoring Board, someone from Myanmar raised an eyebrow and mysteriously my mentions were removed from the final draft. Later, during my years as ambassador to the UN, I could hardly see a clear mention of Pakistani hands in the Taliban terrorist attacks in Afghanistan in the quarterly report of the UN Secretary General, which were prepared by Myanmar. This is despite massive evidence produced by joint investigations between Afghanistan and international partners and given 
a bipartisan request from all political and civil persuasions of Afghanistan during the historic visit of the UN Security Council to Kabul in January 2018. Since 15th of August 2021, no doubt, UN development humanitarian system, despite its heavy overhead cost, uh, have been or has been helpful in not allowing the humanitarian catastrophe and human and economic collapse to get completely out of control. Agencies like FAO, OCHA, UNDP, UNHCR, UNICEF, WFP, WHO, IOM have all had active parts. UNAMA has played a key role in the coordination and facilitation of humanitarian assistance and the much needed financial resources, as well as donor coordination. But when it comes to facilitation of dialogue between relevant actors and stakeholders, UNAMA's absence on different platforms have been noticeable. For example, the Vienna Conference in September last year and Herat Dialogue in November last year. There has been little interaction between UNAMA and the real opponents of the Taliban. Also, when it comes to the gross violations of human rights by the Taliban, we're still waiting for UNAMA to explain why it didn't allow the UN Special Rapporteur to visit Panjshir in May last year to assess claims of war crimes and crimes against humanity. The visit and serious investigations of the claims could have prevented the two major war crimes that took place in Panjshir in September and other war crimes in Badakhshan, Andarab of Baghlan and Daikundi later in the year. Serious claims of Taliban use and abuse of international aid require thorough and regular investigations and explanations to the people of Afghanistan and the international community. We know there is a sensitive line between engagement with the Taliban and the dire humanitarian conditions. Overall, the Enama mandate, in my mind, has been more reactive with a focus on human rights, courtesy of Norway, Last year, Norway really pushed in that direction to get um, um, you know, more involved in human rights. Uh, so it's been more reactive than proactive and preventative. The UN was not born to react. It was supposed to prevent crisis from happening. So what's the outlook? The performance of the Taliban since August 2021 um, proves that the regime will neither bring security nor stability to the country. It is not sustainable, yet it has turned into a real threat to the human race wherever it may be, in South Afghanistan, in the region, or around the world. Under the policy of unity, defense, and pressure of their opponents, and when I say opponents, I mean national opponents, regional opponents, and international opponents of the Taliban, um, the Taliban, or at least part of them, either bow down to a genuine negotiation or continue their defiance, which will eventually lead to their downfall. If we succeed in bringing them to a genuine negotiating table, the UN is likely to play a serious mediating role. Otherwise, either option, negotiating with the Taliban or seeing their downfall, will lead to a transition period, which requires an inter-Afghanistan conference of all national stakeholders to reach agreement on key issues of peace and the combination of a transition authority of some sort. The UN could be the right organization to host such conference. In addition to these efforts, there is a need for an international conference to seek the agreement of regional and global players on non-interference and support to the transition period. Again, there is another opportunity for the UN to host such event. Given these scenarios, it's obvious that the UN, and for that matter, UNAMA, needs to get ready to play its due role in the potential peace of Afghanistan. It starts with introducing preventative and proactive provisions in the UNAMA mandate while it's being reviewed. It will also require an important and, uh, sorry, it will also require an impartial a person or a team with international stature and authority to push complex matters forward. I know all this requires consensus among the major powers, and with Ukraine war is still on, I don't know how they will agree on other matters. I thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I, I'll come back to you um, in a little while, but I think we'll move now to Annie Forsheimer, um, a Deputy Chief of Mission for the United States Embassy in Kabul and a senior US 
Diplomat, I know, Annie, you've been recently doing some traveling around the region, and I'm looking forward to uh, the publication of your of your analysis uh, very soon. But in the meantime, uh, you want to talk to us about UNAMA's mandate to facilitate dialogue at a subnational, national and international level towards an inclusive government that respects human rights. Um, Ambassador Saikal has really just given us a rundown on uh, what's needed uh, to head in that direction with any sort of credibility or hope for success, impartiality, consensus, a move away from vested interests and the trust deficit that Afghan people have now for um, politics and diplomacy. So what are your thoughts on this? Thank, thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you for uh, to AISS for organizing and uh, Ambassador Saikal has given us a really good uh, layout. Uh, so I only, <clears throat> I only hope to add to uh, what he's already said. There is one area, though, I might disagree slightly, which is the idea of changing the mandate. I think it's something we should all probably touch on. Given the uncertainties within the Security Council, as he mentioned, the uh, other option besides opening the mandate to amend it is to extend the mandate for another year, which would, in, which would keep the positive provisions that are in it. Um, and I think there is something to be said in, in favor of that, um, rather than potentially losing them. And the focus should then be on implementation of what's already in the mandate. So I know that others are going to talk more about some of the issues that Ambassador Saikal has raised about humanitarian assistance coordination, the human rights issues and development. I just want to draw attention, as you say, to the political role of UNAMA as envisioned by the mandate. So in the actual text, UNAMA is empowered to do something that is both urgent and essential to facilitate dialogue, as you said, at the subnational national and international levels with the goal of creating an inclusive government which protects human rights. We absolutely must see more action by the special representative and you and senior UN leadership in this regard. So I know as the ambassadors pointed out that there is very little trust and none of what I'm going to talk about would be easy. None of it is simple and none of it is sufficient. But I want to mention some ways in which that implementation could be improved. So at a provincial level, UNAMA should be creating space for dialogue between Taliban and non-Taliban uh, leaders over the humanitarian aid distribution issue to ensure that aid is reaching those with the greatest need. At a national level, UNAMA should be holding talks with Afghan opposition in exile, members of civil society, particularly women, and others, uh, and, and I know they are doing this in their way, but it should be the main focus of their activity to see how they can constructively engage with those groups, how those groups can constructively engage with each other and even with the de facto authorities and lifting up the needs and concerns of these groups. While at the same time, I strongly urge UNAMA to downgrade its interaction with the Taliban authorities to the technical and working levels necessary to carry out the humanitarian aid distribution uh, that is one of the most important functions of UNAMA right now. But there should be a real, you know, end to to the greatest degree possible the very ceremonial meetings that occur between UNAMA and the Taliban. And then vitally at an international level, UNAMA should be filling a vacuum that exists, particularly as US leadership recedes. The UN should be working with all international stakeholders, especially in the region, to design a framework to promote inclusive governance in Afghanistan and to contain the negative impact of the Taliban's support of narcotics trafficking and terrorism in the region. There are uncoordinated international and regional efforts like a meeting of US and mainly European special representatives that is being held today 
And all of that lack of coordination give the Taliban opening to cert in their search for recognition. The UN Security Council has to assert its role through UNAMA. The Council, with all its faults, is a unique platform that brings together the world community. The Mediation Support Unit, which is housed in the UN Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, needs to be used more, especially its standby team of international mediation efforts. These experts, these could be the people who help with the subnational level. It doesn't have to be the concept of a brand new, you know, bond style meeting. There have to be more dispute resolution and peace building efforts at every level. And there is international expertise that is being that isn't being used sufficiently. Now, there are other changes that are needed to UNAMA's implementation of its mandate. And after 18 months, UNAMA's human rights responsibility should extend to the thousands of Afghans who are fleeing repression. It is time for the international community to economically support refugees in neighboring states to provide employment and education for all. UNAMA also has to make it clear to the Taliban that since they are collecting national revenues, they are the primary responsible parties for food and health care for Afghans, not the international community. The budget transparency of the de facto authorities is essential. There is no good reason that the Taliban is allowed to keep its revenues, spend them on their own fighters and security system, while international funds keep Afghans alive. And in conclusion, I would note that the Taliban is farther than ever from having a legitimate claim to govern Afghanistan. But the Taliban leadership is counting on creeping normalization of its status, with some success as measured by countries like Japan reopening their embassies or China signing major economic development deals. The Taliban have been inflexible and unified in their rule. The international community must be even more unified and inflexible in our respect for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and our pursuit of, and this is a quote from the UNAMA mandate itself, an inclusive, representative, participatory, and responsive government without any discrimination based on gender, religion, or ethnicity. Thank you. Thanks very much, Annie. I might just ask you a question. Um, uh, we recently saw Iran and China, with the visit of the Iranian leader to Beijing, declare their opposition to what was noted in news reports as the Western definition of human rights, as if human rights are no longer or never were universal. Um, we've also got people working for the United Nations who excuse their behaviour, let's say, for instance, in wanting to comply with some Taliban edicts, like um, not allowing women to work for NGOs, um, by saying that they re represent all member nations rather than the universal rights of all human beings. So I wonder, in your view, um, how easy is it um, for, for you, Nama, to um, stick to principles rather than um, bow to internal vested interests of specific members? Uh, and it, it never will be easy to do anything, anything I've prescribed and anything that that really will make a big difference in a complex environment like Afghanistan. That said, it is not difficult at all to imagine to imagine UNAMA taking the words of the Security Council declarations and resolutions. They don't have to dig very deep to find the words to support human rights and inclusive government and respect for all and words against the exclusion of people based on gender, ethnicity, etc. This isn't really a boutique issue. The Security Council has the ultimate authority over UNAMA and they need to carry out the resolutions they've been given. Well said. Thank you very much, Annie. We'll come back to you. Um, for now, we're going to um, move to our next speaker, who is Nahid Farid, 
uh, one of the youngest elected members of Afghanistan's parliament. Uh, Ms. Farid is now an associate at the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University in the United States. And she's long been an advocate of uh, and activist for uh, women's rights. And uh, she channeled her formidable energy into setting up and leading charities, uh, helping women and children and uh, rural development. Uh, she's been a strong voice against violence against women and uh, for expanded access to education and employment for women. Today, she joins us to address the question of whether or not it's possible to ensure that all the people of the country, including women and all ethnicities, are heard and represented in the governance of their country. And is UNAMA's mandate too prescriptive or too focused um, to facilitate this inclusivity? Um, welcome to you, Nahid. I'm looking forward to hearing your views. Uh, thank you so much, Lynn, for introductions. My great honor and pleasure to join this uh, wonderful webinar. Um, uh, dear distinguished panelists, it is um great that I heard you and I'm looking forward to Mr. Rahim's points. I think the ground have been created perfectly and paved perfectly to um, further the discussion. I hope I can add to the points, the great points that are already raised by Ambassador Seika and Ms. Anne. I think the political condition is all over the news. We all know that the collapse of Afghanistan's political system um, brought the situation to the point where we unfortunately are witnessing a government without a nation in Afghanistan and a nation without a government in Afghanistan. So the situation has created an unprecedented vacuum and gap of governance and all the relations that the government must have with the nation for its survival, for its legitimacy have been lost except the collecting of revenue that Anne highlighted. And in the same way, all fields and resources that a nation benefits from its government have been destroyed. So it is irrational to ask UNAMA and other UN agencies to fill this great gap. It is impossible. So, but we can ask UNAMA, and UNAMA can play a significant role to help um, the people of Afghanistan to create a government that they deserve that is true representative of their dignity and their diversity and civilization and coexistence. I, I think this is the whole point. We have UNIMA on the ground. This is the whole point. People of Afghanistan want UNIMA on the ground. And I think this is the important point, the priority that we have to focus in a crisis that Afghanistan people are facing. Today, we have a crisis in the country, we know, because the occurrence of crisis and the subsequent creation of insecurity does not limit it to seizure of borders or occurrence of armed conflict. I think other categories such as political and ethnic cleansing and terrorism, violation of human rights, violation of humanitarian rights, mass killings, um, lack of a democratic system in the country. I, I think all of these can be counted as crisis. And that unfortunately we have all these forms in the country. We witness a state of gender apartheid in the country. We witness a country that um, unfortunately the group that is uh, leading and um, governing the country um, have a suppression and atrocity against its people about against the, the minorities as Ambassador Seyka highlighted very well. So okay, crisis is a, is a process of transformation where the old system can no longer be maintained. So what can be done to, to, to manage this crisis? Um, we witness a disruption and breakdown of Afghanistan normal and usual pattern of functioning. So we must give enough food for thought and enough reason for the members of UN Security Council to re-examine the mandate as they are discussing about it in the absence of almost any international actor on the ground, in the absence of a government on the ground. And so it's, it's an important role. That, that's why we talk about it. That's why we hold all this seminar about it. So Unimal Mandate has, you all, you all see the and read the mandate. It has different angles, different elements, different features. But I emphasize the two most important priorities and main points for Unimal Mandate human rights and facilitating the inclusive dialogue. These two are the most important 
um, factors and elements that we have to have a strong representation of UNAM on the ground. I believe UNAM mandate is critical at this time. Last year, many Afghan women leaders and um, human rights defenders supported the inclusion of a strong um, um, language on women, peace and security, um, and women's rights and human rights in the mandate. And it is reflected in the current mandate and in the language. You will see that um, uh, if you read it. And we also know that the context for women and girls has been deteriorated significantly in the last year. That the Taliban, decree by decree, is realizing their ambition to fully erase Afghan women from the society. So this gives enough reason. This gives enough reason that we must talk mostly about implementation of the mandate rather than just simply extending a mandate um, for UNAMA. We have to think of how effectively we can facilitate the implementation of UNAMA mandate on the ground. Um, acknowledge, acknowledging the challenges is important um, when discussing UNAMA mandate uh, renewal, the challenges that I highlighted. It's equally important to acknowledge that Afghan women inside and outside want to see more from UNAMA, especially in regards to women's rights, especially in regards to women, peace and security. So the two issues that I highlighted, the dialogue and of the human rights, the dialogue of inclusive and representative and participatory and responsive governance. Let's start with the fact that there is no governance system in Afghanistan. There are no women in leadership positions. There are no minorities in the position of um, representation. So ethnic and religious minorities are all broadly excluded. What can UNIMO do? UNIMO could look at creating a strategy at sub-national level to start more systematically engaging women and leaders to, to have their voice, to hear their voice. I think this is, this is significantly important. No decree of the Taliban is uniformly implemented against women. We know there is a geographic vibration. There is a difference in the level of acceptance of those decrees. So this variation must be exploited. Every exemption um, or uh, um, arrangement that can be made uh, can help um, to implement the UNIMA mandate in a systematically um, engaged, uh, system with the subnational level. On the human rights, I think UNIMOR is important in monitoring, in reporting of the violations um, that Taliban are doing against women and against minorities. It's critical in the absence of a national and independent institution to do that, in the absence of civil society to do that, in the absence of media to do that. Resources need to be increased. We see that they don't have enough resources on the ground for the human rights work of UNIMA, for the monitoring and reporting and uh, even authenticating the violations of the Taliban, documenting them for the record, especially on women's rights, given that Afghanistan is creating the, the, the largest crisis of women's rights in the world, a state of gender apartheid that unfortunately women of Afghanistan are experiencing. And we all know the limitations. We all know the challenges um, that um, UNIMO has. They have to try to avoid the state collapse, establishing a dialogue uh, space with the Taliban without providing help to the Taliban. We all know there are all limitations, but they could have been more effective. And what was the reason that they were they have not been effective? Part of, part of the political aspect that Ambassador Seta highlighted, I echo that. But at, at the same time, I argue against detailing the task for UNIMO mission. It constrained the day-to-day -day flexibility required by UN staff um, on the ground. And we have an uncertain evolving situation at the, at the same time. So I argue that the new mandate should it is stay focus on outlining UN's priorities that I highlighted, facilitating inclusive dialogue, reporting human rights situation. And it has, it has to leave room to interpret this rather than giving a too prescriptive, too much 
prescription to the to the unima that they cannot handle. Um, on the establishment of humanitarian and human rights nexus, this is also something very important. It can be political. Humanitarian funds, humanitarian help can be political at the same time. In large populations, in a conflict and post-conflict zone, um, can be controversial. Um, and it cannot, sometimes it cannot reach to the main recipient. Will get stolen, will get diverted. That will, that will be misused. Many people in my constituency, in some constituency like Panjshir and Andhra, in some constituency of my, my other colleagues in the parliament, do not receive the humanitarian um, uh, assistance from international community. So UNIMAR's risk management unit has to be revived to see who is the recipient. Or women are the recipient. All minorities are the recipient of the international humanitarian resource to make sure women are part of planning, designing, and implementing of international humanitarian funds. And this is also something that I wanted to highlight. Um, on the issue of um, a special representative, um, I think they need a strong support from New York, beside of a strong mandate that they need, beside of a strong um, political support that they need to rally these external actors that highlighted uh, by Ambassador Seto. I think they have to let the Taliban know that they are watching them. They are watching every move of them. They have to um, um, maintain the international uh, values and norms if they want to, um, to start and engagement with international community, but at the same time, um, people of Afghanistan want to have a um, um, unimary presentation that facilitates what they deserve. And what they deserve is um, having an inclusive, um, participatory, um, uh, and based on coexistence, and based on the values, and based on civilization uh, of people of Afghanistan. And this is how we can outline a UNIMA's uh, representation on the ground. Um, well, that's all I wanted to highlight at this point. But if there was any question, I want to uh, give room to that. And I'd be more than happy to take that. Thank you. Thank you, Nahir. Um, very comprehensive indeed, and I'm sure you'll get some questions uh, later. Just before we go to our next speaker, I just want to remind our listeners um, that uh, you're tuned in to uh, Reimagining UNAMA from Power Broker to Principle Centric, uh, a webinar organized by the Afghanistan Institute for Strategic Studies. AISS was established in October 2012 in Kabul and is now uh, reformed, if you like, reformulated in the United Kingdom. And this is one of uh, many uh, webinars and um, forums that uh, the Institute um, has been organising uh, recently to examine uh, what happened, uh, what is happening and what needs to happen in Afghanistan to um, uh, take the country back to uh, a place that represents all of its people. And I think that's what we're here to talk about today. Our next um, speaker is our final speaker before we open up to questions. And I'd like to um, uh, encourage listeners to uh, contact us with any questions. Tell us who you are and who it is that you want to talk to. Um, but uh, first we'll hear from Shwaib Rahim. Um, he was a senior advisor to Afghanistan's Ministry of Peace and worked on the Doha peace process that resulted in the Doha agreement that was signed uh, between the administration of former US President Donald Trump and the Taliban on February the 29th, 2020. So I think we can say exactly three years ago. Um, Schweib has also been um, acting mayor of Kabul among um, a, a, quite a range of other senior public um, office uh, positions and currently he chairs the American University of Afghanistan's business school focused on educating young men and women 
inside and outside Afghanistan. Schwab, you're marking UNAMA's report card, um, assessing its performance since the collapse of the Republic on the 15th of August, 2021. And quite counterintuitively, you think that UNAMA's existing mandate does more harm than good and don't believe that the mandate should be renewed at all. Um, it's likely to be a controversial uh, viewpoint and I'm very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lynn. I'd like to thank AISS um, for this very relevant and timely panel. And it's a pleasure to be among esteemed panelists. Um, I think we need to recognize at the outset that global attention is very occupied with Ukraine, and there is even less bandwidth and interest on um, affairs of Afghanistan, which makes this conversation on UNAMA, one of the very, very few um, entities and platforms engaging, continue to engage Afghanistan, uh, uh, especially politically, even more relevant and even more important. We need to use the little we have as best as possible. And I think so far uh, from the interventions of uh, the panelists, in, in varying degrees of diplomatic terminology, the assessment has been that UNAMA has not done a good job. So allow me to uh, uh, initially dive a bit deeper into this, and then I'll get into the proposal I have and the reasoning behind this. So from a, from a layman's point of view, and I define a layman to be anybody who has not worked in the complex UN bureaucrat bureaucratic system, from a layman's point of view, and I consider myself one, um, UNAMA's political mission seems to have the following mandates as per resolution 2626, which ends March 17th of this year. I'll, I'll read out a few of these mandates and then share my assessment, touching on a few of the points mentioned by other uh, esteemed panelists. One is to provide outreach and good offices, including to facilitate dialogue between all relevant Afghan political actors and stakeholders. Where has this engagement been since the collapse of the government and since Taliban's takeover? Where has the attempt to reach out and start this dialogue been? The platforms which were created, uh, uh, far and few, have not benefited from the gracious presence of UNAMA or the representatives, unfortunately. Um, and so this kind of begs the question um, on why UNAMA is sitting on this mandate and not moving forward with it. And I have a few ideas which I'll, which I'll share um, uh, a bit later. These platforms and gatherings of non-Taliban non political actors took place in Vienna and Dushanbe, uh, uh, movements in Turkey, but UNAMA was nowhere to be seen. Second part of the mandate, promote responsible governance and the rule of law, including transitional justice, monitor and report on political security, social and economic developments. Um, the targeted killings, the arrests, the torture of civil servants and journalists are pretty well documented on, on social media. And we unfortunately see business as usual, your regular tweets, perhaps uh, inter-organizational reports, uh, but we do not see uh, a position or pressure on the de facto authorities. Three is to engage all stakeholders. Um, I'll, I'll be summarizing it. Engage all stakeholders uh, on human rights, protection of human rights of all Afghans, uh, prevention of torture, monitoring of places of, uh, of, of uh, detention. The Andarab human rights violations, uh, human rights violations in Panjshir, in Badakhshan, in Daikundi, the fact-finding missions and reports, unfortunately, um, are missing. And when access is demanded, it is not provided. And the conversation essentially stops there. Integrate gender mainstreaming as a cross-cutting issue is a part of UNAMA's mandate. We have regressed on these rights, starting from schools, then to universities, and now to the workplace. What is next? Next mandate is to monitor and report on violations of abuse against children, support regional cooperation. The region seems to, seems to be self-interested, so UNAMA is not necessarily leading any regional efforts as well. Uh, finally, a support within its mandate, uh, existing mechanisms to improve overall security situation in Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, if you were to take the Taliban's position, uh, it, it is the most peaceful Afghanistan has been ever. So, you know, that seems to be UNAMA's position. But harboring Al-Qaeda, 
um, um, and terror cells, the attack on al Zawahiri in the heart of Kabul, none of these merited Yunama's response or action. The very few progress that we have seen on Yunama's mandate, mandate is this very strange dummy mandate or a proxy mandate of coordination, where Yunama is tasked with coordinating humanitarian efforts, when in essence, humanitarian efforts are being led and managed by, by OCHA and UNDP and other humanitarian related organizations. So that's not necessarily the primary role that UNAMA plays. So with this very brief assessment uh, of, of you know, the metric set out by the Security Council, it's Council itself, um, since the Taliban's takeover, UNAMA's report card on almost all counts of its own mandate is a, is a disappointing F. And so, you know, I'm not a diplomat, so I'll, I'll, I'll speak freely um, uh, without layering my suggestions. My proposal is that the Security Council not renew UNAMA's mandate uh, because its continuation is doing more harm than good to not only the citizens of Afghanistan, but the interests of the international community. Now, I want to qualify this proposal by saying that um, what I mean is UNAMA, UNAMA is an exclusively political assistance mission. And the humanitarian aid efforts, as I, as I alluded to earlier, is implemented by other agencies such as, such as, such as OCHA, UNDP, um, and the rest. So this proposal does not affect humanitarian, um, humanitarian aid, which is a completely separate conversation, um, which Ms. Farid uh, alluded to as well in her talk. An alternative model for political engagement could be the UN Special Mission to Afghanistan model, or UNSMA, which was used in the 90s with Lakhda Ibrahimi um, having the freedom to not be bound by geography, to move within the region and engage with many of the regional actors and domestic actors, which I think given the, given the current disbursement of anti-Taliban uh, or non-Taliban actors within and outside the country might be a far more relevant model to reach out um, and not be bound or intimidated by, uh, uh, by the host entity. So I have a few reasons why I think this proposal uh, um, might be worthwhile and might be more effective. The first is that I believe that UNAMA is almost held hostage uh, uh, by the Taliban and the level of the fear of missing out uh, on engagement with the Taliban seems to be a driving motivator. Um, I completely agree with the, with the suggestion that UN should downgrade its own engagement. But uh, um, I think that'll kind of play into what the Taliban are already doing. We've had the most one, like the most senior UN officials visit and try, attempt to uh, meet uh, um, you know, Amir Haibatullah only to meet the deputy governor at an airport. Um, and so, you know, begs the question, you know, why are we, why are we continuing to persist on a failed model? Um, it seems now the report, the political reports of UNAMA are focusing more on Kabul and Kandahar differences between the Taliban and see that as engaging different political stakeholders than any non-Taliban actors. Second, I wanna mention what I think is an, is an unfortunate observation, which is that engagement for the sake of engagement itself is self-defeating. Um, and to a large extent stems from a bit of a colonial mindset where there is no principle centric or or moral centric approach saying things like well you know believing in human rights or different types of freedom of expression or fundamental rights which were protected in the previous constitution that's not necessarily something that's too relevant so we're going to continue engagement just so we don't miss out on any updates or information but we leave the other issues um, on the sideline and so the response to news of targeted killings of former ANDSF members, civil servants, journalists, um, unfortunately sees extremely, extremely little uh, and, and very little reaction from UNAMA itself. Then there's the argument of resources. UNAMA's assisted mission is one of the largest UN assistance, political assistance missions in the world. Um, those resources can be channeled to greater humanitarian aid in a time where aid and resources are extremely, extremely limited. Finally, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the next pen holder of Afghanistan at the Security Council, um, uh, currently it's Norway, uh, might be UAE. So there will be even less 
enforcement of any mandate, the current one or any extensions. So I think I think a realistic, and I'll wrap up now, I think a realistic approach is to expect the UN political engagement to do no harm. I think if we do no harm, that might be considered success. If I mean, it's an extremely low bar. But continuing as is with a written mandate, which is not implemented, seems to be giving the Taliban a very clear message that we will, we will tweet and we will put out these statements, but in reality, it will make no difference and you can continue doing what, you, what, what you're doing right now. And so it's emboldening these extreme positions uh, uh, that the Taliban are taking. And I think the only way is that the United Nations Security Council um, um, do a proper assessment and look at UNAMA's report card and, 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 and basically shut UNAMA's offices down and change to a more mobile, flexible, and responsive offer with the hopes that we might be able to um, um, serve the interests of the people of Afghanistan as well as the international community more effectively. I'll stop my talk there. Thank you. Thanks, Shwaib. I think that's a, a very good um, assessment. Uh, if you like, um, uh, like I said, a bit counterintuitive to the, the rest of our speakers, but you you mention um, engagement for its own sake and you mention fear of missing out, uh, FOMO, you say, you note that uh, UN um, uh, senior officials and UNAMA officials uh, do like to meet with uh, or at least try to meet with Taliban officials. It seems um, the selfie with Haibatullah or Siraj is, um, is much sought after. Um, but is this, is this enabling the Taliban excesses? There doesn't seem to me to be any consequences, but is it enabling? Um, is this benign um, uh, approach that you outlined um, uh, really doing more harm or is it just um, that they're not doing enough uh, to comply with the, the UNAMA mandate to uh, reverse the Taliban's uh, propensity for digging in? Well, I think to answer that question, you'd have to see who the audience of the narrative is. I think the audience of Taliban's narrative is internal. First, among its own rank. Second is the population. Political legitimacy and credibility in Afghanistan for decades has been gauged by the extent to which the authorities um, are engaged with by the international actors. And the international community is giving that willy-nilly and freely to the Taliban. Every time an ambassador, a diplomat, a clerk meets with somebody from the Taliban, that is, uh, you're doing a great job, you are legitimate. That's it, that's all they need. Um, and so that is the harm in, in the broader uh, conversation of recognition. I think de facto, we are, the international community's engagement is giving them de facto recognition. I mean, what else do you need? So, so my proposal is try to address the matter at the heart of the issue, which is um, it's more than just, it's more than just talk. There are consequences for you not fulfilling the obligations that you have as a de facto authority. And you know, we actually mean business when we put these mandates. Otherwise, I mean, it's very hard to take the UN seriously. Um, thanks, Shrive. I think that I would like to um, hear from uh, Ambassador Saikal on your comments. Um, Ambassador, um, the what we've just heard from Shuaib is that essentially the Taliban have been handed de facto recognition uh, by uh, UNAMA's actions or inactions. Um, and I think it's fair to say that there have been no consequences for their excesses and uh, atrocities um, as have been well documented over the past 18 months. What's your view about that? You talked very cogently um, about uh, the UNAMA mandate and its upcoming renewal and the UN uh, SC role in this. What's your feeling um, and thoughts about uh, Schweib's proposal that we just get rid of UNAMA altogether? Ambassador, you're on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Hello? 
Um, I cannot hear you now. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Okay. All right. Um, I think at the end of the day, we have to find a solution for Afghanistan. What's the way out? And uh, somebody has to have the facilitation. Somebody has to play the host. Somebody has to make sure that plays a mediating role. And among, we don't have a lot of options. Um, the UN is an achievement of mankind. Mind you, over 77 years, we have found, we've, we've established a platform upon which multilateral diplomacy can take place and 193 member states can, can interact. Um, the expectation is that the UN would be that impartial player, that would be that impartial party that could uh, facilitate um, um, the, the, the dialogue, uh, as mentioned by, by the panelists. Um, so getting rid of UNAMA altogether, okay, will probably damage that kind of facilitation. But improving the performance of UNAMA is probably the, the answer. And as I said, um, there has been a very reactive kind of mind in the part of the UN in total when it comes not only Afghanistan, but other conflicts around the world. They let the conflicts take place and then they react to the consequences of the conflict rather than preventing it. I've been witness to the um, uh, Secretary General's reports to the Security Council, numerous reports, when you go through them, these reports are comprehensive. And within these reports, you can see signs of troubles coming. And it's the job of the Security Council to analyze and to do something to stop the troubles coming. Um, my feeling is this is where we have the problem. Uh, we, um, the, the five permanent members, it's very rare to see them having consensus. Uh, conflicts elsewhere, namely Ukraine conflict, conflicts in the Middle East and all that, have an impact on this. For example, you see the relationship between China and the United States going sour over Taiwan, the relationship between the Russian Federation and the US going sour over Ukraine, and then they don't talk, they don't interact. And as a result of that, we don't get a good mandate. They don't agree on the terms of, of, of UNAMA mandate. We've seen this. I think uh, we saw a disagreement between China and the US. And as a result of that, for the UNAMA mandate was only extended for six months instead of 12 months, for whatever other reasons that they had. Uh, similarly, we have got the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, trilateral dialogue between the US and China and, and uh, Russian Federation uh, involving uh, the extended uh, Troika involving Pakistan as well. Last year, they met in China because of the Ukraine war, they failed to reach an agreement and to sign a, 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 a joint statement. Um, so if I could just sum it up, I think we do need the UN in Afghanistan, but we need to refine it. We need to really be critical of their failures and we need to look at them, see what we can do. The issue of Afghanistan over 45 years has involved many players, the national players, regional players, global players. So multilateral diplomacy has to be there, of course. And how can we shrink this multiplicity slowly and could bring it down to bilateral, trilateral levels? where we could reach agreements. Uh, I think one of the failures that we had in Afghanistan in the past seven or eight years, as we were talking about peace, we involved as many players as possible and they each came with their own agenda. You know, from, from international players, from Norway to Indonesia, from Qatar, from UAE, from a host of players who came with their own agendas and with their own rivalries and with their own interests and they brought it to Afghanistan. I think uh, what is needed is to make sure that we do have a healthy uh, multilateral interaction, but with the aim of shrinking it in, reducing the number of players and really focusing on the main players and see how can we establish a healthy dialogue among them. But in all of this, 
I still see a role for the UN, but we have to refine that role. We have to make sure that the UN plays the due role um, and, and it's, it is being impartial. I mean, we've, we've seen uh, while the people of Afghanistan are suffering from the atrocities of the Taliban, all of a sudden we see a policy of appeasement, you know, bribing the Taliban to see if they can change. And, and this concept of engaging the Taliban has been so strong. Initially, we were told that the Taliban have changed, they're flexible. Well, that was a failure. And then we were told it's engaged them for another year and a half. But thank God now, I believe the positive sign is that finally the people of Afghanistan, majority of the players in the region and the international players are all coming on the same page that the Taliban cannot bring security in Afghanistan, the Taliban cannot bring stability in Afghanistan, the Taliban cannot bring development in Afghanistan. So we need to get our acts together. This is why we need better coordination of interest. And this is why we need to refine the, the, the mandate of the UN in Afghanistan. Thank you, sir. And Nahid, you've been watching probably more closely than anybody uh, the evaporation of the myth of Taliban 2.0. Um, uh, very few people, I think, listening today, certainly on our panel, would have bought that line before August the 15th, 2021. And um, all of your worst uh, expectations, I imagine, have been fulfilled in the 18 months since then. Um, you talk about, um, during your, your presentation, you talked about um, the support that you now needs to facilitate a, a broader inclusivity. And you've heard um, Schweib say, get rid of it. You've heard Ambassador Saikal say, refine it, fewer players. Um, uh, more accountability. Um, what's your feeling? Are you somewhere in between there? Um, deep down, do you really think it's not working, get rid of it? Um, how do you assess the two sides of the coin that are here before us? Um, yeah, um, Lynn, I think we heard almost the same thing from all the panelists that say that they want a strong representation of United Nations in the country to facilitate the priority that people of Afghanistan want, the, the political dialogue, the reporting of human rights situation. And um, they have to have the confidence to do so. They have to have the political willingness to, to, to do so. They have to have the the support from United Nations to do so. And to narrow down this, um, this might be a UN representation through um, a, another special representative. It can be the same, it can be different, but we want an effective representation and effective presence of UN in Afghanistan. Because as I say, there has an unprecedented situation of lack of governance. Uh, groups say that we are the government, the people say they're not the government. There is a lack of relationship between these two contexts, unfortunately. And there has to be a mediator to, um, to, to facilitate this dialogue. Not just that, the regional factor also have been missing. Mr. Rahim pointed it very well. I echo what he said, that Afghanistan have um, um, regional, uh, Afghanistan crisis has a regional element that is very important and regional players can play a very significant role in solving this problem and there has to be an organization and UN can be an organization to do that and I think um, UN can be an eye an ear of the world that what is going on in the country as well. Um, this has not been fulfilled. The reality on the ground was not reflected. So we say there have been a UNM on the ground. It, it is not effective. They don't um, give enough, um, they don't have enough resources at the same time confident to do that. And how to make sure this is um, going towards a more constructive uh, process, we have to facilitate that and we have to give enough um, food for thought to security council members to make sure UN plays the significant role the people of Afghanistan want and deserve. 
Indeed. Um, Annie, can I turn to you? Um, you mentioned during your um, presentation that um, UNAMA should be filling the vacuum as the United States recedes. Um, the US does have a special representative. It has a department that concentrates on, on looking at um, Afghanistan, what's going on there. Uh, diplomats do travel around the region and the world to engage um, others on uh, the situation there. Um, but there is also a perception, at least I have the perception, that policy is not uniform. And I think because um, there, you know, we have Ukraine, it's very easy to say atten attention is diverted, but there are dedicated um, officials and diplomats to um, Afghanistan and its, and its region. Can you um, put that into a context? Why, why is it that the United States is receding when there are specialists in the field whose job it is to engage? And um, uh, why is it that um, UNAMA is, seems to be um, incapable of filling that vacuum? There, there is a disconnect there. What's your view? With, re with respect to the United States, there is a special envoy's office, but the level has uh, been downgraded significantly since the days that there were U.S. troops on the ground. There is absolutely no comparison. They share a name, but the current special envoy is at the level of a deputy assistant secretary. And the special envoy of the days when Richard Holbrook held the office or even uh, Ambassador Khalil Assad these were advisors to the Secretary of State, uh, and it is a completely different interagency process from the past. There is very, very little coordination that goes as far as the senior leadership at the State, at the state Department. And I, I would say from the outside, uh, almost none that goes to senior leadership within the White House. Um, for various reasons, this is an issue that the White House has chosen to stay away from, and there have been, uh, as far as I know, uh, no uh, no mentions of Afghanistan and its human rights problems by the president, for example. It is absolutely insufficient to say that, uh, that Ukraine exists. There is always a crisis somewhere. That's no excuse, but um, the U.S. has made a specific it seems policy decision to downgrade the level of its attention to Afghanistan. So again, the fact that there's an office isn't really that relevant. Um, I would say right now it's a little mystifying to me that there still seem to be, uh, you know, the United Nations and the European Union uh, reflex to wait for the United States when making policy decisions. If I were in the EU, for example, I would notice that geographically there's a lot more risk than you know the US will ever face from issues of narcotics, terrorism, or refugees. So I would think that the EU should be taking the lead. If it were the United Nations of old, and I, you know, I think there are many ways the UN has chosen to address its proactive role of peace and stability, of course they should be taking the lead, and the United States would take its rightful place as a member of the, you know, the Perm 5 of the Security Council and a major donor, period. Beyond that, I don't think the US really deserves to have much of a role with respect to this issue of finding a way forward uh, with regional engagement uh, and, and to bring Afghan uh, parties together. And finally, I just have to note that, that it is fascinating to consider a world in which UNAMA is voted out. And uh, I also think that, uh, that Mr. Rahim's making a hugely important point about the separation of the humanitarian coordination role from the political role of UNAMA. They, as long as I have been familiar with UNAMA and when I served there, they really felt that as part of a unified mission, these two had to be under the same person. But I think there are more reasons to think that UNAMA is held hostage on security level and politically by its massive infrastructure in country and maybe that political role does need to be delinked from the humanitarian coordination role. Interesting. We, we've got a couple of um, 
uh, listeners who want to ask some questions. I'll come to you, um, Fayaz Gaizi. Um, can you unmute yourself and identify yourself and tell us who it is that you would like to address your question to? Fayaz, are you there? Can you hear me? I can hear some noise there. Fayaz, are you going to ask a question? There you are. Unmute yourself and ask away. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Indeed. Go ahead. Hi. Yeah. This is Fayaz Ngiasi, former diplomat of Afghanistan and Tajikistan. Uh, my question is uh, uh, from Mr. Shah Ibrahim and a part uh, to Ms. Nahid Farid. Uh, as Mr. Rahim, you mentioned that based on the uh, resolution of 26-26 dated uh, 17 March 2020, uh, 2002, UNAMO's priority and core work are defined by Security Council apart from uh, other mandates uh, which you mentioned uh, is facilitating dialogue between all relevant Afghan political actors and stakeholders. But in the last one year and a half, this mandate was absent. Don't you think there are influence of some great powers such as US and other permanent member of the uh, Security Council? And uh, Ms. Nahid Farid, you uh, highlighted some challenges. You said some, there are some challenges of UNAMA mandate implementation. Uh, could you please highlight uh, a few of those challenges? What are they? Thank you. Could I then? Please go ahead, Shua. Thank you, Faiz. Uh, great, thank you. Great question. Um, I think I'll answer uh, picking up on what um, Annie alluded to earlier, which is the downgrading of US in, like bureaucratic engagement on, on the case of Afghanistan. And so I kind of sympathize with the US administration, ironically, a little bit here, because the US started backtracking and dragging itself out of Afghanistan and kind of nudged the UN to fill that gap and fill that role. But the UN failed. And the UN, for whatever reason, was not able to pick up where the US um, uh, tried to transition responsibilities. And so now you have a situation where the US is not invested because of active policy decisions or whatever reason um, uh, that that is the situation. And the UN also lacks that institutional clarity to move forward. The Europeans are, again, looking around to seeing who else is prime mover on the issue of Afghanistan. But I think institutional inertia has kind of compounded itself to, to uh, make for this bureaucratic mess. And I think at times maybe decision makers just look at UNAMA and you look at Afghanistan and they're like, this is just too big a headache. Let's just not fix what's not broken apparently. When in reality, um, you know, the con like, it's not business as usual. I mean, that's the point that I'm trying to make. If we assume it's business as usual in Afghanistan, then that means the Taliban win the day and they have been winning the day every day since a year and a half. And so I think, I think rather than trying to look at political intent and gaming the system, I'd rather look at this as a, as a design issue. And I think UNAMA's current design kind of hampers the UN's ability to facilitate and meet, it, meet its mandate. So I think closure of its offices and this very wide reaching uh, um, uh, network across the country and focusing on a purely political mission might give it the agility and the level of flexibility, um, which are not terms associated with the UN in any shape or form, by the way, but might give it that speed to actually get things going. So I, I wouldn't read too much into the US interest in it. Although of course that, I mean, the great power uh, um, issues are always there. But I think that I blame more the, the systemic laziness or inertia, which my proposal tries to address. Thanks, Shuaib. Uh, Nahid, would you like to address the question that, um, that uh, sure. Azzy asked you? Sure, yeah. So the challenges um, is important. It was important to have someone from UNO on this discussion. 
Um, I participated in different workshops in the last week with different stakeholders who want to talk about whether we have to extend UNMA mandate, reimagine it, re-examine it, stop it, continue it as it is. And I heard different um, perspective from UNMA people on the ground. So some of them um, um, highlight the fact that this repressive um, policies and decrees that Taliban have um, is a great challenge that they cannot reach to women. They cannot reach to women NGOs. They cannot reach to different um, stakeholders on the ground. This is one of the main reasons and main challenges that they highlighted. Lack of resource was one of other issues they highlighted. And politically looking to the issue, they don't have consensus in New York. Uh, all countries do not support UNAMA. We have um, countries who are against it, who are uh, just quiet, they watch. We have Russia uh, who didn't even vote to this mandate. Um, we also have European countries who want to direct the funds and any measure towards more humanitarian assistance um, aspect of this um, representation on the ground. So these are the challenges. So European countries have different ideas. US has different perspective. Um, um, other um, regional factor, regional players have different way of looking to the issue of UNMA presence on the country. These are the challenges. And besides of that, um, the Taliban, the Taliban also have their um, list of demands. Taliban say that if we want to have a dialogue and engagement, why we are in the blacklist, why we are in the travel ban, why we have sanctions. They also have demands that actually um, highlighted by these people. But my idea is that UN has to have a very uh, constructive role in facilitating the dialogue in the national level, in the regional level, in international level, to help the people of Afghanistan create the government they deserve. You're muted, Lynn. Uh, excuse me. I will go now to a question from Andisha Nasir Ahmad. Um, if you can unmute, your, unmute yourself and ask your question, tell us who you are and who you would like to um, answer your question. Go ahead. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, my question is uh, uh, for everyone, and, and that is uh, uh, related to the mandate of UNAMA. Number one is that uh, don't, don't see the speakers uh, feel that uh, in the past almost 18 months, UNAMA seems not to be accountable uh, to anyone uh, except uh, the, the Taliban. Because in many of the international occasions, uh, UNAMA is missing, despite being invited. So it doesn't it doesn't really show up where it needs to show and to and to talk. But that's number one. Number two is UNAMA itself. If you look at the mandate, it was mandated toward the legal constitutional government of Afghanistan since August 15, 2021. I think the things has changed. So the United Nations Assistant Mission to a non-state actor has to be a separate thing. Either the name has to change to United Nations uh, Assistant Mission to the Taliban, or as uh, Mr. Rahim suggested, it has to be either back to a special mission or the political mission separated from humanitarian and located somewhere which could be accessible uh, to, to everyone. Uh, and that is, I think, one. And final thing that I wanted to add is that, you know, in terms of downgrading uh, diplomacy, <laughs> so even UN is at least, you know, we, we have uh, Security Council and there are some discussions about Afghanistan. It seems right now that the uh, Western colleagues are further downgrading diplomacy of Afghanistan and throwing it to the shoulders of the OIC, which has never, you know, fulfilled anything around the world. 
And that's, again, another level of misery if, if you know, the diplomacy will fall to the OIC, uh, where Pakistan is the secretariat. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I think, Ambassador Saikal, um, I should direct um, Andisha Ahmad's question to you. Uh, UNAMA, is it absent without leave? Um, should we call it um, the United Nations Assistance Mission to the Taliban? Um, uh, should it be reformed as a political mission? And OIC, please explain. You see, separating the humanitarian activities from uh, political, um, at the moment, UNAMA plays the coordination role with the donors. And you'll have to play the diplomacy of making sure that there is enough contribution for, by the donors towards the humanitarian needs. Um, would the humanitarian um, um, area have its automatic coordination? Uh, I don't know how to respond to that. I mean, I can see that uh, when the Joint Coordination and Monitoring Board was on, UNAMA and a representative of Afghanistan, they were co-chairing it, and that was um, bringing interaction between Afghanistan and the international community. And again, UNAMA played a coordinating role. Um, but I think uh, uh, Ambassador Andisha made a valid point that um, initially UNAMA was established to work with an officially recognized uh, government of Afghanistan. At the beginning, it was an interim authority, which gave birth to an interim administration. Within six months, it became a transitional government, and UNAMA was interacting with it. Now, uh, it's interacting with a basically a terrorist group in Afghanistan. So we need to look at that. Um, and um, the point I was trying to make earlier that how can we move from reactive uh, activities to preventive activities? Let me just give you one example. Uh, the Taliban have announced for, for some time now that they've been establishing um, in each district between three to 10 madrasas. Now, on average, if you allow five madrasa per district, we've got around 400 districts, that's around 2000 madrasas being established. Think about this, that the way they pick up the children of Afghanistan and they brainwash them, and within the next five years, you can imagine teenagers rising up, all of them ready for committing suicide and all of them ready to doing radical things. So this is what I call a process of radicalization. Now, we know that, you know that, the rest of the world know that, certainly the Security Council can see this and certainly the reports of the Secretary General can alert the Security Council members that this is about to happen. So we need to prevent this from happening. What preventive measure is there from the Security Council to stop this from happening? As we speak, it's, it's going on. And every day that we allow the Taliban to breathe, every day that we allow the Taliban to extend its life, it means that they are making advances in all of this. And what we do, we continue to whinge about it, we continue to complain about it, we continue to issue presidential statements within the Security Council, press statements, and the best we can do is to issue a resolution. And mind you, when it comes to the implementation of the resolution, which was emphasized by um, Ms. Nahid Farid, I have seen the poor implementation of these resolutions. I have seen the poor implementation of the sanctions regime. As I said at the beginning, if only 50 to 60% of the sanction regime was truly implemented, the Taliban wouldn't have been where they are today. And like that, the other counterterrorism resolution, 1373, you know, all of that. So um, that is another side of it. But again, um, realistically speaking, at the end of the day, we need to see whether the priorities of Afghanistan becomes the priority of the UN Security Council, because at the Council, we all know that it is first the national interest of the five permanent members, and then of the other 10 um, elected members, uh, and then the rivalries between the members, the five permanent members, not, not all of them, but sometimes we see the three of them having those tensions. 
All of that, will, would they allow the priorities of Afghanistan to come at the top of the list and really um, design um, um, uh, resolutions with provisions that could have impact on the situation in Afghanistan? Um, so sometimes we need to look at the entire history of the UN, how decisions are made. Sometimes we have to, realistically, we need to look at why UN Security Council has got five members who've got the veto power, why they are permanent members, and all of that. Why on earth, in the past 77 years, we've only seen one reform in 1965, which brought the number of Security Council members from 11 to 15, and beyond that, there is no other reform. So with that kind of structure of the Security Council, let's not expect too much, you know, that uh, whatever we say that they, based on justice, it will happen that that will be taken serious. Uh, so realistically speaking, I can see that there is some room. The best we can do is to refine, is to really stick the UN in its role to the charter and make sure that it becomes an impartial player, make sure that we get healthy decisions within the limitations that we have. Beyond that, I don't know how else we can find a, a, an impartial player that could play host to the dialogue of the multiple players within the nat national politics, within the region. Um, I don't know how else we can find that kind of player. At this stage, that is the only option and we need to make the best out of it. Okay, thank you, Ambassador. I think um, uh, uh, we have one more, um, we have room for one more question and I'll go to Mark Bowden who um, knows Unama from the inside out as a former deputy representative. And um, I know our last uh, questioner asked you about the OIC, but I think that you're leaving it out of your answer says um, as much as we need to know about that. So um, Mark, if you're there and you can hear me, can you unmute yourself and please ask your question and let us know um, who you would like to address. Go ahead. Well, uh, I thought I would just respond more to some of the statements being made about UNAMA than ask a question, if that's all right, Lynn, because I've been involved in an internal review uh, of uh, the functioning of UNAMA uh, and thought I might be able to clarify some of the issues. If that's yes, okay. please do. Of course, it's okay. I'm very happy to hear from you. I'll just note that UNAMA was asked to take part in our webinar today, but um, uh, I'm told they refused um, to attend, um, but you go ahead. I think your perspective will be most interesting, Mark. Thank you. Well, uh, I, I'm clearly not speaking uh, for UNAMA, but uh, have been involved uh, with UNAMA. As you say, I was uh, 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 DSRSG uh, and the humanitarian coordinator. Uh, I, I think just to make a couple of uh, comments about the dilemmas that are being faced at the moment. I'm, I'm actually not unsympathetic to the idea that there may be a, a need for a new model of, of engagement by the UN, but the question is at what time uh, does uh, that take place and, and what you lose by moving uh, to a new UN model. Uh, I think that the uh, 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 that the situation is riven with uh, particular political and ethical dilemmas, both for the UN, the international community, uh, and the humanitarian community at the moment. Uh, and uh, the, the challenge is really uh, whether you think the Security Council route is the way uh, to reshape UNAMA or whether uh, there is more that can be done uh, internally with with the, the current mandate. I, I think that's the mandate. That's a judgment call. My judgment at the moment would be uh, that uh, you can achieve more by internal reform and review, which is a process that Unama uh, is is going through uh, at, at this stage. Uh, and just to highlight some of the areas. Uh, that have been uh, under review and discussion, which may uh, help provide some sort of greater uh, reassurance, uh, is uh, uh, looking again at, at the role in regional engagement, how to re-engage, recognizing that the whole nature <clears throat> of regional structures has collapsed, 
uh, and uh, the changing uh, focus on, on, on regional engagement in the country, looking at uh, how to strengthen dialogue at national and sub-national levels, uh, provide greater support to humanitarian actions, uh, uh, particularly uh, looking at preserving civic space, civil space uh, at the regional and local level, uh, uh, and uh, above all, to uh, strengthen and manage more effectively uh, the, the human rights role. And I think it's the human rights role uh, that uh, has faced uh, particular problems. I'd also say, as someone who set up the risk management unit, uh, just as I know it was mentioned, uh, there's also been a lot of discussion about strengthening and in uh, re-engaging uh, the whole ro role of risk management. So there is an internal reform process uh, in hand uh, at this stage. Uh, and, and I think that uh, we also need to recognize what is a very different context uh, in uh, Afghanistan with increasing control uh, and a very uh, shrinking civil space, the creation of uh, the alarm uh, is at the provincial level will create even more, more pressure. There is a, a divided, uh, I, I think, uh, humanitarian community at the moment in terms of how to respond. Uh, and uh, it's in this context, I think Unama's political role is actually quite important uh, in creating and helping to create the space for uh, political, uh, for humanitarian engagement. The real challenge is, uh, and I take the point that the Taliban will seize on all opportunities to see legitimacy, is how you manage to do that. And I think that's an, an, an issue of, of sensitivity and, and increased sensitivity. But just to say that a lot of these issues are on the table, I think that the there's only so far you can manage them uh, through a security council that is in fact quite uh, uh, deeply divided and, and risks getting into more problems uh, than, than providing solutions uh, in its current state. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks, Mark, for your um, for your participation. Much appreciated and very nice to hear from you. Uh, we have um, another question in the wings from Sanjar Sahail. Um, Sanjar, if you can unmute yourself and um, identify yourself and who it is you'd like to speak to and ask a question. Uh, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, hello everyone. Thank you so much uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity and uh, glad to see many familiar faces. Uh, my question is uh, 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 about the mechanisms uh, to, to, to go and follow uh, um, for the changing the mandate of UNAMO. Uh, what are the mechanisms? What, what tools we have to, uh, to, to do this? And uh, the second uh, question is to Annie. Um, uh, she she mentioned that uh, we should lower our expectations from uh, the US. Um, can she elaborate that a little bit more? Thank you so much. Thank you, Sanja. Go ahead, Annie. Are you um, are you comfortable answering both of Sanja's questions? Uh, sure, I, I can try, but on, on the question of the mandate uh, sort of renegotiation, I think others are, are very expert as well. Um, you know, what are the mechanisms in other parts of the world? Sometimes a regional organization does take the lead. Ambassador Andisha's points are well taken about, let's say, the OIC. But, um, you know, the Security Council could ostensibly be working with a regional organization and take a lead from them. I don't think that's really possible. Um, I, I, I guess I really feel like it comes back to the council and um, before we 
move to a different format, we do have to coldly assess what we could lose in the process. Um, but I, I think everyone should be open to it because in particular, the concept that UNAMA is sort of on a straight line from what it used to be, that that's clearly not working and it cannot work uh, with a government that lacks all legitimacy. Um, with respect to the United States, um, at the moment, I, it's just sort of self-evident that the U.S. has ceased to put real political or policy capital into the Afghanistan problem set. They do not elevate it in meetings with uh, leaders around the world. Uh, they are not willing to take the, the time and effort, uh, let's say, at the Security Council or in other formats to um, try to you know, to get a compromised position, it's it's difficult but doable with Russia or China uh, to improve the political mandate of, of UNAMA. So I'll just say that the departure of U.S. troops is honestly the departure of the United States as a major player on Afghanistan, uh, no matter which way it is dressed up, period. Just on the mechanism, um, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Go ahead, Ambassador. On the mechanism, currently, well, um, often there's a pinholder at the Security Council for Afghanistan, but uh, this time around we've got the UAE and Japan as core pinholders for Afghanistan. In, in fact, in the past few years, we've had core pin, pinholders for Afghanistan. They open up the, the, the existing mandate of Yanama for discussion with key countries, with Afghanistan itself, but at the moment we have the charge of peace. I, I believe there is some level of consultation with him, but also other regional countries. But uh, at the end of the day, it's the decision of the 15 members of the Security Council. And Afghanistan has never been a member of the Security Council. Mind you, we had an opportunity to be a member of the Security Council this year, 2023, but that was traded off. Sorry, 2021, that was traded off with India and we lost that opportunity. But uh, so when you're not a member of the Security Council, um, you, can, you can be consulted, but at the end of the day, whether what you say will be accepted or not is a different matter. Um, so I would say that currently the, the mandate of Yanama is under discussion and the consultation with the key countries of the region. Uh, and then eventually it will go to the Security Council itself. Uh, and of course, uh, P5 has a big say, and then, uh, and then the other 10 members, sometimes they could gang up, they could take a stand. I don't imagine that they could take the five, the 10 of them could come together and take a stand on the mandate of UNAMA. Um, but they would really look towards the major players like the US and Russian Federation and China, and perhaps countries of the region, Pakistan and India and Iran and so on, but they are not members of the council. Um, UAE uh, is in our region, has got probably a better understanding of what's going on, what's the politics of the region. Um, yeah, so that is eventually it, it will go to the members of the Security Council and uh, I, I don't know how and why should the interest of Afghanistan should become more important to, to their own national interest and to their regional interest and to their global interest. But definitely the peace of Afghanistan is important for all of us. The way we see it, that if we let the Taliban stay one more day, they keep asserting their authority, they keep brainwashing the, the younger population of Afghanistan, they're changing the curriculum of the schools and of the universities, fine, even if they allow girls to go to schools, they will have a different curriculum. They want them to become one of the Taliban. Already we've seen the recruiting of little girls in the madrasas in different parts of Afghanistan. So uh, what, what I want to appeal for is that the Taliban has become a menace to the human race whether that human race is in Afghanistan, whether the human race is in the region, whether that human race in Latin, in Latin America, it's the collective responsibility of all of us to do something about it. We're doing our best at our national level to do everything possible 
in, in sort of multi-pronged strategies that we're developing as opposition, uh, but we need to coordinate that with the region and the rest of the world and make sure that we either bring the Taliban to a genuine negotiating table, and definitely the UN can play a key role in that, or if that doesn't happen, eventually we have to see the downfall of the Taliban and we have to enter a transition period and we need to really think about the details of that transition period. And this is where the UN can play a role. And this is why I'm just saying that it is important that we refine the mandate of UNAMA for that kind of situation where the UN can really play a, a, a healthy role. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you, everybody. We're out of time, but I feel like our discussion has uh, really thrown down the gauntlet, really, and certainly food for thought, to use uh, Nahid's um, favourite phrase there. I, I um, you know, reassess, remake, uh, trash, start again. Um, there's, there's a lot going on, and, and I, I'm very grateful to all our panellists for their participation and comments. Ambassador Mahmoud Saikal, Deputy Ambassador for the US, um, Annie Forsheimer, former parliamentarian Nahid Farid and former acting mayor of Kabul, Shwai Brahim. Uh, big thanks to the Afghanistan Institute for, Strate for Strategic Studies, easy for me to say, um, to Dawood uh, Muradian and Khandan uh, Danish for your um, terrific organisational skills. And thank you to everybody who tuned in um, and lent us your support. Uh, thank you again. I've been Lynn O'Donnell and it's been my pleasure and I hope we can can do this again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.